Well, good, good afternoon, everyone. It's, um, it's an absolute pleasure to be here at the Royal Opera House. And um, I suspect that um, everyone was very tempted by this beautiful location uh, to come to this conference, not just by, because of the nature of the subject. And um, I'm really delighted to be here in a room that was supported by Paul Hamlin, who I uh, had the chance to work uh, for his foundation, the Hamlin Foundation, which supports arts and education. Uh, and um, it's in that spirit that I, I want to focus on future talent, because um, you cannot avoid the, um, and, and we mustn't ignore, the creativity uh, that the arts provide in learning. And one of the, uh, one of the things we must all make sure happens is that education has, within its framework, um, the arts at its heart, um, because the arts plays such an important role in human development and developing potential and aspiration. And I certainly saw that through my work with the Hamlin Foundation and its partnership with uh, establishment, established organizations, institutions like this one, which opened up uh, to people from different social backgrounds, young people and older people from around the country. So the institutions like this were not exclusive uh, and did not exclude people from different walks of life. So I was asked to speak about developing an inclusive approach to future uh, talent. And I want to start off with a vision of where we must go. I think everyone, whether you come from business, or the arts, or education, or other uh, walks of life here in this room, will all agree, and we, whichever political party we belong to, we are all agreed in the fact that we have to be ambitious for young people, and we have to be aspiration, uh, aspirational for them, whatever their background. And now, more than ever before, young people face the biggest challenges that they have faced for generations. This generation is less likely to do as well as their parents' generation. That is unprecedented because historically, uh, the generation uh, after uh, the parents' generation tend to do better. And we need to make sure that we put in place the ambition, the aspiration, and the policies and actions that will support and fulfill the, their aspirations, and that we maximize the talent of young people in our country. So let's look at where the challenges are. The challenges are that, as a country, we have 21% less productivity than the G7 average. That According to the CBI, 37% of employers are not confident that they can meet an immediate skills gap uh, in the jobs market, which means that they are recruiting some 300,000 people a year from overseas. So we have a skills gap in this country, and those of you who are in HR, in the world of employment, know this all too well and tell us constantly that we have to act to address that. We also have absolutely huge issues with inequality, with poverty and deprivation that holds back young people from, particularly from uh, disadvantaged backgrounds. But if we don't tackle the problems early on through tackling child poverty, through making sure parents have the opportunity to work and build a decent life for their children, then those problems get bigger and more significant in later life. In my constituency, for instance, 47%, a staggering 40, sorry, 42% of young people, children, live in poverty. In around the country, 2.6 million children live in poverty. That's one in five children in households who are facing poverty in one of the biggest, richest countries in the world. So if we are interested in future talent, we need a government that is going to tackle the root causes of poverty. And the evidence shows only last week, the report, a report that came out showed that child poverty is going up, 
and the government's going to fail to meet its child poverty target by 2020. Now, that means that we're going in reverse. There was progress that was made in reducing poverty in the past, but that is being hampered. The government's own commission found this. So early years and child poverty and making sure that young people have the best start in life is critical if we are to ensure that their talent is harnessed and that they are supported to do well, do well later on in life and access the world of work, having got a good education uh, along the way. We also face massive problems with a lack of social mobility in this country. Once again, we see now that a young person today will find it much harder to reach professional uh, jobs if they come from a less privileged background, if they come from disadvantaged backgrounds. This is a huge challenge for us because it shows that Britain remains a very unequal society. Britain remains a society where social class and networks provide a critical ladder to achievement to the top of the professions. Whether it's in my profession in Parliament or in the business world or in the public sector or the legal profession or uh, any of the other major professions in our country, we have a class divide in our country that has not uh, got that much better. And the evidence on social mobility shows, in fact, things have got worse in recent decades. And all parties have a responsibility to make sure that we create the policies and building blocks to enable young people to thrive, to do well. Now here, it's early years intervention that makes a massive difference. I know that because in my constituency, in my borough and all over London, we saw a transformation in education because it was to do with early intervention, early uh, years uh, policies to support parents and young people uh, through short start programs but also through investment in primary education which then created the building blocks for children to do well in secondary education. As a result, in areas like London, you see very, very rapid improvement in educational attainment uh, over, the last, uh, over the last decade, particularly in the recent years in secondary education. That wouldn't have happened if we didn't invest in early years education, in primary education, as well as secondary education. And we've seen gradual but, but uh, exceptional improvements in other parts of the country as well. So we have uh, some great positive stories, um, but also evidence to show that when we make interventions early, when businesses get involved in schools through mentoring, through work experience placements, through creating uh, a line of sight for young people to be able to uh, see the kinds of professions they could get into, even if their parents don't do those jobs, didn't do those jobs, they are in a better position to be able to seek those kinds of opportunities, to consider those places, places in which they can work in. So, that kind of intervention in education is critical. My party has proposed that we should strengthen uh, the support to parents through childcare because what we see is a million women who are not in work, but they could be if the policies were, were set up in such a way to enable them to access work um, through provision of better childcare, more affordable childcare, and more hours in childcare to help them to uh, make it their worth to make it their worth their while to access uh, um, uh, affordable childcare and be able to get into the world of work. The minimum wage was a critical factor in supporting families uh, who face poverty, and we believe that it's really critical to make sure that that the minimum wage keeps up with the level of inflation so that it is a genuine, um, uh, it allows families who face in-work poverty, which it accounts for very high levels of poverty now, get the kind of support they need. Now, at the time, many employers were concerned that that will be a burden on them, but the evidence has shown that not to be the case. Um, in terms of what else needs to happen, we need to make sure that within the school system, there are uh, 
high, there are highly qualified teachers within the education system. Uh, the current government has said teachers don't need to be qualified, and yet the evidence shows that if you have trained, qualified teachers, that makes a bigger difference to a young person's ability to do well in school than anything else. So this is a critical issue for us as a party, and we have committed to making sure that uh, teacher training and person, uh, teacher training and development will be critical to, um, to supporting uh, those in education, as well as uh, making sure that uh, we provide proper independence, careers advice and guidance to young people, which is another area where there's been very little support. So employers have been told that they need to get more involved, which is of course very important and welcome, but they cannot be a substitute for independence, careers advice and guidance. The evidence shows that many young people are not getting appropriate support, and that is costing uh, significant amounts of money in lost uh, productivity because young people end up taking uh, the wrong decisions at critical points in their lives. So we need a uh, proper careers information and guidance system for young people. We need proper support in the education system so that they can get the qualifications that they need in order to be able to access the world of work. It also means more effort has to go into STEM subjects to support young people who at the moment are not making those choices. And that's where the skills gap is uh, particularly significant. So there are major issues that need to be resolved around the education system. There are also major challenges about what we do to support young people to access employment and training. And that is why we uh, as a party have committed to making sure that we create a credible, highly prestigious vocational education pathway for young people. So if you asked any parent um, what their child should be doing if they didn't want to go to university, or any young person what they might do if they didn't want to go to university, or they didn't have the, the right qualifications to get into university, most people would, ha would struggle to explain what that pathway is. Whereas if you did A-levels and you followed the academic pathway, it's much more clear-cut. And as a society, we are much more focused on the university pathway, where 50, some 50% 50 of the population go, but it's much more challenging to work out what the pathway is for those who seek alternative routes. This is the group that Ed Miliband calls the forgotten 50%. And a significant proportion of that group end up uh, out of the education system altogether, or they want to follow a vocational pathway, but there isn't a prestigious, well-regarded uh, enough system for young people to pursue. And that is why we have set out uh, a framework for making sure that young people can uh, do qualifications, uh, such as the uh, Tech Bac Baccalaureate, which is uh, a qualification that um, provides a vocational pathway into apprenticeships and, and then higher apprenticeships, which was announced yesterday by the leader of the Labour Party, to make sure that young people can, if they choose to take a vocational pathway and earn while they are studying, have the opportunity to do so. If we don't create these pathways uh, and only have one route, which is the university route, although that is an important one, um, then the danger is that you have a whole generation of young people who do not have a credible, appropriate pathway into the world of work. At the moment, we've got 870,000 young people who remain unemployed. That has to change, and the only way we're going to do that if, is if we create a proper vocational pathway, which does not block off the route to university should people wish to go to university, but may ensures that they have those pathways that employers recognize and meets the skills shortages that employers are so concerned about. The final area that we feel we need more effort uh, uh, to, to ensure that young people can access work, can access the opportunities they need, is around making sure that the, um, those who are out of work 
uh, have the flexibility to gain the training that they need. At the moment, the 16-hour rule, which requires young people uh, and others to only have a limited amount of time to get training when they are unemployed, means that they're not always able to access the kind of training they may need. They, in fact, they will get penalised. And that's why we've m made it clear that if we form the next Labour government, then we will get rid of that requirement so that there is the flexibility for people to get the kind of training they need quickly when they are unemployed in order to access work very, quick, very, very fast. So what does all this amount to? Um, does it help us to address the big challenges facing our country and ensure that young people in the future can truly be confident that their talents will be nurtured and that we will maximise their talent for the greater good of our society and our economy. I believe that governments can only play a part in that role, first of all by creating the right framework through the educational and training frameworks, but also links with the world of work. But critically, it's up to employers and it's up to communities to play their part. And that's where you come in. As employers, to ensure that young people have work placements from an early age, work experience, the requirement to not provide work experience, having removed that, means that now young people from uh, who are not from middle class backgrounds are less likely to be able to access work experience opportunities than those who come from professional backgrounds. Now, that is something that the world of work can and is playing a big role in. We need to make sure that those social class differences are not reinforced. Secondly, if you look at this room, we all have social connections and relationships that we can deploy in order to support our young people. Now, programs that employers are engaged in, in mentoring, in training, whether it's employability training and support, whether it's giving paid internships, paid uh, opportunities, even if they're short term, make a massive difference to the opportunities that young people can then pursue later on and get them into the career ladder. So employers play a very, very, can play an even bigger role, more ambitious role in enabling young people from different backgrounds to access the world of, uh, world of work. And the third area is where individuals play a critical role. Uh, as mentors, I've seen that through projects I established. One of the charities I set up, uh, which supports uh, 19 to 25 year olds for employability training, but also for leadership development, is focused on building social capital for those who don't have it. People from white working class backgrounds who are very talented, but cannot uh, access professions, access uh, leading institutions, uh, get into politics and other institutions because they don't have the confidence, they don't have the connections that confidence uh, helps to build their confidence. So when we see the kind of e effect that mentoring and support from people from the wider community, uh, including employers, can have on enabling talented young people uh, from uh, working class backgrounds to reach for the stars, if you like, you can see the results in what they then go on to do. And I've seen hundreds of these young people go on to start up their own businesses, tech businesses, social businesses, charities, um, but also enter into politics, into local government, and many other uh, professions as well that they wouldn't have dreamt of. So, we all collectively have a responsibility to harness the talents of the next generation. Now that requires commitment and leadership from government and I hope uh, this time next year, uh, if my party is in government, that we will invest in young people's futures through investing in uh, early years education as well as secondary 
uh, and tertiary education into proper vocational education, but also in making sure that the world of work and the world of employers can play a positive, active role that is not marginal, but central to what happens in, uh, in terms of how we enable young people to access opportunities and employment. Thank you very much. Just got a couple of uh, a couple of questions for you, Rashnara. Says, uh, how can we how can we work towards a better long term future for the country when we have political parties that focus on discrediting their counterparts and short term gains in time for the next general election date rather than achieving long term goals? Is there a specific easy specific examples? Uh, no, I think it, it's more I've about it's more about party it? politics. I think it's just uh, you know should we be should this be a party political issue or should this be actually this is about all of our children doesn't it, it, it is, is politics a key part of this or actually should should we be dealing with this as a as a whole well look I, I think we should be dealing with this as a whole and by whole I mean uh, uh, politics the uh, the world of employers uh, and civil society and and the community as a whole now if you're asking me that is politics relevant to this debate absolutely because uh, if we want to meet the demands of the labor market and the future labor market, then you require, and this is, this is constantly something that employers rightly complain about, you need a framework, um, a, a policy framework that harnesses talent, that provides the right kind of skills for young people to get uh, in order to meet the gaps in the labor market now and also be prepared and ready for the needs of the labor market in the future. So where we're talking about education and training, uh, governments, whichever party uh, is in power, uh, have to play their part in ensuring that the right kind of framework is set up, the right kind of educational policies are in place and training policies are in place. If you take the work program, and, and you might, some people might say, and the questioner might think that's a party political point, but it's not. The work program, which was introduced uh, in 2011, I think, um, it has led to uh, a huge amount of public investment, your money, and the results are, in the first year, only 3% on, on the work program uh, of young people got into jobs. It's gone up to about 10%. Now, that is a disgrace. And I'm not going to apologize, as a politician, for holding the government of the day to account for that. You, as taxpayers, would not forgive us if we didn't. If people don't like that, uh, uh, then uh, perhaps we need to think about how those questions are asked and how the presentation happens. But the substance of it is, we are, as an opposition party, um, there to hold the government to account, and we would expect the same if the government of the day is a Labour government. Okay, well, one more question on a similar sort of theme, I would say. Um, politics plays such a part uh, in this space. How do we enlighten our children to understand who to vote for and how to realise ambition rather than resentment? Yeah. Well, I think, I mean, it's a really such an important question because uh, everyone everyone's aware of the, um, the constant um, concerns about uh, disengagement in the political process. And yes, absolutely, politicians have uh, a lot to answer for. Um, the political culture in our country, I just left Prime Minister's Question Time and my ears, was, um, ears were hurting at the yarboo nature of Prime Minister's questions. And week in, week out, the speaker tells people not to conduct themselves in that way. And very few people listen. It puts women off, it puts viewers off. Um, and that kind of political culture is one that seems to not appreciate how the country, and particularly young people, are looking at the political classes. So how we present ourselves, how we conduct ourselves is absolutely critical. And it's not just exclusive to politics, it's to, it, it's relevant to business. There's a general distrust of established organizations and institutions, the business community since the financial crisis, the media community since the phone hacking scandal, um, and now um, you've got another massive scandal 
that is but how do children make up? sense of this? So, how do they make so, sense of actually who should I vote for? Who, who is really going to change the education of this country? So I think, I think that um, we, we are not going to be able to solve the resentments uh, and anxieties people feel about politics if we don't deal with the fundamentals, which is why those, those bigger questions about trust and inst how institutions conduct themselves, individuals conduct themselves in these sectors, including politics, is critical. I think there's a big role for education, uh, the school system, but also in the wider community about making it something that's part of our civic duty, our responsibility to vote. And I think that when you get young people thinking and learning about the fact that in other countries, uh, and I see that in schools in my constituency, are literally uh, people are losing their lives because of the uh, determination to have uh, the right to vote, to have um, democracies, they can see all too well how important that it, that, that it is. But I think that uh, we have a tendency not to uh, provide the political education, the civic education, if you like, um, and citizenship education uh, that young people need in order to participate. And the evidence shows that when young people volunteer, when they are active in their communities, when they are engaged, they are more likely to vote. And I certainly found that with work that I've been doing it through a charity I established uh, through a program called My First Vote. And it shows that uh, when young people are involved in making something happen, whether it's uh, something within their community or more generally in a single issue campaign perhaps. They get more engaged. They get more engaged and they're more likely to. And when they understand how the power structures work and how they can make a difference, like all of us, we're more likely to be active and want to take part. Okay, Rashna, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.